welcome to the Teacher's Toolkit for Literacy, the free podcast for motivated teachers and school leaders who want to inspire their students and school community in literacy learning. Make sure you subscribe to the show on your favourite podcast player, and for more amazing literacy resources, check out the show notes provided with every episode. Hi, I'm Sharon, and I'm the host of a Teacher's Toolkit for Literacy. In every toolkit episode, we bring you specific resources, tools, strategies, tips, techniques to help you in your job as a teacher of literacy. Firstly, we acknowledge and pay our respects to the Ghana people, the traditional custodians whose ancestral lands we gather on. We acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and relationship of the Ghana people to country, and we respect and value their past, present and ongoing connection to the land and cultural beliefs. And welcome, Phil. Thanks, Sharon. And welcome to our special guest, a fabulous educator right here in South Australia who's been supporting schools across Australia with her consultancy work and also spending some time authoring wonderful books to guide educators. Uh, And welcome, Lisa Berman. Can you just tell us a little bit about your background? I'm from South Australia originally. Um, My educational background is um, early childhood. I often say that's my first love. That was my first degree and then went into special education and and school leadership. Um, I worked for many years with Catholic education here in South Australia, both in the country and in the city, and uh, was a deputy and acting principal here for a while before I had the opportunity to go to New York, which is where we met, obviously. Yes. Um, I often say I went for a year of adventure in New York and I ended up staying 10 years. And I've been back here in based in Adelaide since 2011 and um, have my own consulting business running from here. So what was your focus in New York? What was some of the areas that you worked on? Yeah, it was kind of two arms, I guess, and it's very similar to what I do here. The very strong literacy consulting arm, but also early childhood. So I know, um, you know, we both worked for the same organisation with Diane Snowball in in New York. Um, What an amazing opportunity that was. And um, I think I was one of the few consultants who um, had been asked to work with a couple of schools just on early childhood, so um, in the pre-K area. So I was lucky enough to work with one school for nine years in that space. So that was a little bit more than just literacy. And was that a bit of a jump going from Australian, what was happening in Australia to what was happening in New York or was it similar? Um, I've reflected a lot on this and I think you know, many of us have, have talked about the things that are similar and the things that are different. You know, in, in some ways children are children wherever you're going and we're thinking about learning but some of the things that I found are culturally different in terms of um, the education system there was well coming from I think a very collaborative school where we were you know, working in teams, team teaching, um, we were leading very collaborative processes in our school and, and I think that was not an uncommon thing in Australia, uh, to a very much I found a lot of the schools in New York anyway were very siloed and the teachers were quite isolated in their room and didn't necessarily even really know the person who was teaching in the same grade level next door to them, let alone collaborate with them. And there were some core practices, I guess, that it made me realise that I'd taken them for granted in Australia and definitely in South Australia. I probably realised I took them for granted, the things that um, Australian educators would come, you know, with their little toolkit of strategies and core practices and particularly in the area of literacy, you know, things like read aloud and and shared reading um, and just the way that we would interact with children and be curious about children and work with them from that premise. Some of those things were a little different in my very first experience in New York and I think that's partly what we were invited into schools to help them with. Yeah, to try and uh, help them with that rather than mm. just giving the, giving the children content, do you think? That's right. Um, and also helping them to... Um, I almost think about finding your own voice as an educator and designing it yourself rather than relying on those scripted programs. Yep. Um, yep. And uh, So looking at a curriculum and then you can work out your own scope and sequence of what you're going to teach based on the needs of your children. Exactly, in front of you. yeah. exactly. Yeah. And you know, using assessment tools to do that and then reflecting on that. And, and I think also um, one of the reflections I've made over the years is that Australian teachers – at the time seemed to be very, and maybe this is part of our Australian um, psyche, you know, we've got the kind of this attitude, oh, yeah, we'll have a go at that. Mm, and so yeah. 
I found that, unfortunately, for whatever reason, and many of the teachers I was working with in New York felt um, afraid or unsure to give something new a try until they'd been perhaps modelled ten times. <laughs> like It felt like I needed to help them to have the confidence to have a go at something because I was so afraid of getting it wrong. And it made me reflect on how in our cultures in schools, I think particularly, you know, coming out of the 80s and 90s in our schools in Australia, we were encouraged to innovate. We were encouraged to try different things, but then to take that research lens with us to try something out but reflect on it and see if it made a difference or it didn't make a difference so it wasn't just trying things out just because we thought it was a fun thing to do no um yeah so do you think the american teachers were so used to following a a program or a script that they couldn't see beyond that do you think that was part of it yeah and i mean this is an over generalization of course um i'm not doing the work or or, you know the individual teachers any justice but yeah largely I think that that might have been part of it and unfortunately I do see that starting to happen here and in Australia the reliance on someone else planning what you're going to be teaching and whether that's a scripted program or you're you're handed something from you know a coordinator that you need to teach to me isn't actually teaching because part of what I think you know I always loved about being a teacher is knowing the children really well, knowing, you know, yeah, knowing the content, knowing learning, knowing child development and putting that all together and coming up with creative ways to engage children to best learn. Yeah, because sometimes the following of the script is encouraged because they say it's going to save you time by doing that, then you don't have to plan, it's already done for you. It might save you time. I just it's not the way I want to be a teacher. But it, but, but mm-hmm. it doesn't, doesn't kind of work that way, does it? Like you don't really follow the needs of your children because you're doing something that's sort of um, not geared to all your children. That's, that's sort right. of right. Mm. Maybe it suits a few, or maybe not. <laughs> um, so some of the work you've been doing when you came back to Australia. Again, I've still got a very strong literacy arm to our work. Very strong early childhood arm. So. Even Saturday morning I was facilitating a workshop for ECHO, the early childhood organisation here in South Australia. I've been involved with um, Reggio Emilia Association here in Australia too. I do some facilitation for them. And, um, I mean, my favourite work still remains being in a long-term relationship with science, whether that's a preschool or a primary school. Mm. Uh, We're now working with a middle school as well. And um, having that long-term relationship with the site, as you know, Phil, um, you know, it means that you get to understand their context really well. Just yep. like we do, we talk about doing this with children. I feel like we want to do this with, with educators and with communities as well. And so we've got some partner sites that we've now been working with for a number of years in South Australia, interstate, and I also work with a couple of partner sites in Southeast Asia too. So, yeah, working long time is is quite rewarding because you can really go in depth with the school. That's what we find in our work too. I suppose it's like um, if you had a class of children and you only had them for one day as opposed to having them for the whole year, yeah. uh, then you can really do things and you can, you know, you see, get all, deeper with it yeah, and, yeah, see sure. all the changes. And so is there a particular way that you like to work with schools that, say it was a new school that you were working with, mm. you'd find out what their their needs are first and then you'd work out with the leaders what you're going to do? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we, we often say what we would offer is something bespoke for you. Um, yep. We've got some – being in this work for over 20 years now, um, you know, I know some things that work really well in terms of modes of learning for professional learning and so I can offer those. But the way we package those up and in terms of what the, the goals of that project might be, that's definitely something that's that's created in collaboration with the leadership, teachers – Um, and, you know, with our perspective on things too. So depending on what the brief is, sometimes schools contact us and they already know very clearly that they want to explore writing workshop, for example, and others may not be really sure what they want to explore. So um, in those situations, we will often offer what we call a day of listening Mm -hmm. and uh, me or one of my team would spend the day observing, listening, getting to know who they are, talking with children, talking with educators and with leadership and to help them to define what it is that they're actually wanting to, where they want to grow, the pedagogy. Yep. You know, you've been doing it for over 20 years. 
Have you noticed things getting easier or more difficult in the education environment that you're in or is it hard to say? I think, I think the thing that has changed the most is actually the lack of teacher agency that's coming in, I'd have to say. You know, the if I compare it to, you know, my career, most of my career as an educator, I was able to design that teaching and learning for the particular group of young children I was with. And I think one of the big changes that's come in is all of these messages that teachers are having to uh, deal with now about this is the best program or if this is your problem, buy this and this will fix it for you. And I feel really concerned at how disempowering that is Yeah. Um, and how my fear is that it will actually deprofessionalise us. Yeah, Um, yeah. And uh, we, you know, being a teacher is not just what we do in front of the children. It's all the thinking and the intentionality and the learning design that happens as well. Yeah. And that's part of being a professional, I suppose. Exactly. You know. Yeah. And do you think that adds to the stress? You know, we hear stories about teachers being more stressed or their well-being is not as looked after. Do you think that adds to it or they're leading yeah. questions, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, I think at the end of the day... It really depends on the culture of the school, which is dependent on the leadership a lot. Mm. You know, I work with some amazing um, sites that have such a strong culture of teachers collaborating, of feeling supported to try new things, being supported to be that kind of researcher about learning and about their children. Um, And so they would still... I think, say that they're feeling pressured and they're feeling like they're working really hard and and some of the complexities that children are bringing with them into school is is exhausting for everybody. Yeah. Um, But in those those kinds of schools, those kinds of sites, educators work really hard like every educator does, but they're feeling like they're making a difference. Yeah. And they've got real purpose. Yeah. I suppose the frustrating thing we feel too is that we'd like to be, you know, as consultants we can only be in a certain number of schools, can't we, to help Mm. out. But you see that there's probably a bigger need out there but you can't sort of solve it really. No, and we can't can't solve it if I've come to terms with the fact that I'm not a good fit for every school. Yeah, yeah. And every school's not a good fit for me either in terms of what my beliefs and my values, my philosophy is. Um, And so... I feel like the people who are aligned with our philosophy find us yep. Um, yep. and then we do our very best to help them to grow in whatever way they are interested in. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. And so... Um, Thanks for the big questions to start with, Phil. <laughs> yeah, we haven't even got into the main topic yet. <laughs> I was talking with someone the other day about it works better when people work with people rather than people working with textbooks. Mm, you know mm, what I mean? Mm-hmm. We all help each other a lot better than relying on this thing that was written by somebody yeah. else, maybe from another country. Exactly. That doesn't know our class. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, even just that idea of working from a book, like we teach children. We don't teach a subject or a teach book. We teach yeah. children. We teach young people. Yeah. And it, it just feels very um, mechanical. And I guess it's that metaphor of the factory model again. Whereas when – those learning cultures as educators and we're collaborating with each other and we actually can get creative and design the learning ourselves. Yeah. It's so much more fun. Yeah. That's not even very good English. It's more fun. Yeah. It's um, more rewarding, I think. You work hard. It's not. I'm not saying it's easier, but I think my experience has definitely been that you get more reward from that. And the kids are more engaged, we find, and mm. definitely less behaviour problems. Yeah. Really, that's one of the byproducts, really, isn't it? Yeah. And that's kind of a natural thing because they're naturally more engaged. But you've decided because you've noticed these things in classrooms, especially that you've decided to write a recent book about student agency. Mm-hmm. Do you want to tell us about why you started mm. that? Mm. Um, my, my first book was published when I was living in New York mm. and that's about listening to children and using their ideas to launch and to design curriculum. And what's that one called? That's called Are You Listening? Okay. It's very much tailored around the early childhood years. Yep. Um, and then it was a long time coming, this second book, and I think it was because I had too many ideas. 
I actually really like telling this story because I have a very clear memory of when I went, right, I've got the idea for the book, oh, great. the next book. And it was actually sitting in a South Australian school, right, an education department school. And my role at the time was coaching writing workshop. Mm-hmm. And I was in, I think it was a year one, two class, this particular teacher. And if anyone's read the book, you'll know who I'm talking about. And I was just in awe of how these young six and seven-year-olds were so purposeful about their learning, Mm -hmm. how engaged they were. They really didn't need their teacher. She was there conferencing. She did a little writer's meeting and a mini lesson. She was doing some very clear intentional teaching. She was conferencing with children. But they were just all off with this real sense of agency. And it was sitting there on the day and I had the thought to myself, right, what is it, can we name what this teacher is doing? If we can name what she's doing, because it's not just about writing workshop, it's not just the pedagogy she's using there, it's actually about the learning culture that she's created right? all throughout the day. Um, so I thought if I can help name the things that teachers like her do, then we can all learn from that. Great. And the title? The title is A Culture of Agency. Right. And it's got a by title, but I can never remember it. <laughs> That's terrible. It's my own book and I can't remember. I can put it in the show notes later. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so agency, what do you mean by this? And what, what is this thing that you've found in that teachers are able to harness that makes this work? It's complex, yeah. Is it? Yeah. Mm. But is it gained through experience or is it can you Oh, this this teacher hasn't necessarily been teaching many years I, I think let me ask your first question first like what is agency because I think at the moment it's actually in danger of becoming another edgy speak you know jargon yes. right I'll everyone's go by, talking going by that yeah there yep <laughs> all right I'm going to give this kids a dose of agency yes <laughs> yes but you know from the early childhood perspective we've actually been using the word agency for a long time yeah and well my belief is that we all have agency, the capacity for agency. I don't think I don't believe it's something that we can give people. We're born with agency. So it's a potential within you. Yeah. Yep, yep. And you know, the classic example, you know, back in the eighties when I was studying child development with my first degree, is the baby lying on the on their back on the crib and they kick the mobile and make mm. it move and then they actually realise that if they do that with their leg or their arm, it makes it move. Yep. So it's that internal understanding that I can make things happen. Right. And in terms of learner agency then, I think that translates into that feeling or that sense of I'm in charge of my learning, I'm in charge of my life. I can make decisions and make things happen. It's kind of doing instead of being done to. If you yes. Know what I mean? Very connected to that internal locus of control rather than an external one. Yes. Is this related to executive function? Because I've heard of that. Yeah, well, executive function would all be part of that, I think. Yeah. You know, executive function talks about things like impulse control and focus and concentration and working memory, all of those components. And agency is more like, for me anyway, an inner drive. Right. An inner drive. And so, you know, the workshop that I actually facilitated on Saturday morning was called It's More Than Choice. Because just providing choice for children doesn't necessarily mean that they'll feel a sense of agency because it's got to be more than just a one-off. Yep. Yeah, I guess we talk about having choice by um, having a classroom library and you've got Mm -hmm. lots of choices in your classroom. But, yeah, it's then actually taking action on that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so – and I'm not saying that choice isn't part of it, but it's more than that. Yeah. Yeah. and I think that example of classroom libraries and children having the right to choose what they read, yep. that would help them have a sense of agency, have a sense that I'm the one who's like the main player in my learning. I'm, yep. I'm not waiting for somebody to tell me what I have to read. No. I'm actually in control of that. And then to really develop that further, it would be the conversations you'd be having with that child, respecting yep. them as a reader and having conversations with them about... Um, you know, their own learning processes and their preferences as the reader and what they're going to read next and um, placing them really as the person 
who's in charge of their learning is probably the by the way you're talking to them and the way you're questioning and and I suppose modeling is one way of doing it but it's probably more about the questioning and the talking to them isn't it yeah and your second question before is about you know what did I notice that the teachers do so um, after that first experience I gathered a small group of amazing educators all from South Australia because my publisher is an early childhood publisher it is preschool up to about year two three but I think the things I talk about in the book are applicable to all age groups yep so this amazing group of educators and I really researched what they were doing in their classrooms and then synthesized that together with a bit of a framework so the framework's really just a way to organize our thinking around this and to name it you know that idea of if we can name it clearly then maybe we can all do this a little bit better Mm -hmm. and a little bit more intentionally so in the framework right in the heart of it is relationships right and i even called the chapter relationships are everything um, because i think they are and so all of the teachers that i researched and collaborated with made the time to build really strong relationships with the children with families they also enabled and gave lots of time for the kids to make relationships with each other too so it wasn't just about educator child it was also child child relationships then the other components are things like the learning environment the physical and the temporal learning environment the decisions you make about that, that that creates the time and opportunity for children to act with agency, which might mean initiate something themselves. So, you know, without time to do that, that's really hard if everything's broken up into little 10-minute mm. sections or something. The physical environment that creates a space that's safe and nurturing and, and emotionally secure. Yep. Then another component would be... The language that we use, the language of agency. Another component um, or characteristic, I guess, of of the framework is um, the context for learning. Yep. And I'll talk about the context for learning as being the place that the learning takes place. And it could be an approach. So writing workshop would be a context for learning. Reading workshop would be a context for learning. Loose parts play is one that I write about a lot. So we've got context, we've got language, we've got uh, the environment and relationships and so putting all those things together then creates this uh, world where the child can then uh, develop that agency and will most children do it well if i reflect on those classrooms that i mentioned or those preschools that i mentioned very diverse communities some of the communities um, children have many challenges in life that they come to school with Um, So with all of that diversity and complexity, I see all children being able to act with agency given the right conditions. And I guess that goes back to my belief that it's not something you have or you don't have. (laughs) It's something that you will have the potential for. But one of the things that really supports that to happen is having an emotionally secure culture. And so one of the other things I write about are rituals, rituals of belonging and rituals of identity. And so the rituals that I saw the teachers use with their children bound them together, if you like. It made the community, it made it a place of, oh, we do this together. And so to act with agency often means you feeling confident to share your idea, no matter what it is, or to get up and get the materials that you need to solve this maths problem, not just use the materials that the teacher has put out. So you need to have that kind of emotional security there to, to really... So what are some of those rituals, like for example? Yeah, yeah. so um, you know, it might be a gathering ritual at the okay. beginning of the day. Yep. Like a, at Nudu College, they have a yarning circle. So they know morning. that's going to happen every morning. That's right. So. Um, because it's an early childhood book, um, a lot of singing was featured. Mm-hmm. So it might be a transitional uh, ritual that a song is sung to help children to transition from inside to outside or from one experience to another experience. Mm. If I think about writing workshop, there's rituals in there. The mm. ritual of coming together mm. at a sharing circle. Mm. The ritual of maybe doing a turn and a talk. I explain rituals as being like routines with heart. So oh, that's good. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they're things that help bring markers to the day, which builds security. Mm. 
we all know how important that is for children to have that sense of predictability in their day. So routines are really important that, but if we also bring more intentionality and more thinking towards it, it becomes more of a ritual than just something we're doing because that's what we do at lunchtime. Mm. These are things that the children will almost take on themselves as a class. They'll say, well, this is what we do now. This is exactly. the thing we do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that made me think of kind of my catch phrase, I guess, now that I'm using quite a lot in my workshops about agency. And it came about because I said it in a you know stream of consciousness moment at a workshop in Perth last year. And all of the participants just automatically put heads down and started writing it down. I thought, oh, I've got something here. And that is that if we're interested and committed to children feeling a sense of agency in their learning, then I think we do less to and for children and more with them. That's good. Yeah. And so that idea that, you know, one way to move a routine into a ritual would be to involve the children more. Yeah. So that they either participated and it wasn't done to them. Yeah. Or they had a say in what kind of ritual it was that they were going to use. Yeah. And we'll take a break there from part one of our podcast. We look forward to you joining us for part two. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the podcast. To make sure you don't miss any literacy learning tips and insights, please subscribe to our show on your favourite podcast player. At Q Learning, our literacy specialists draw on over 30 years of teaching and international consulting experience to deliver world-class learning solutions. We equip, empower and support teachers to become their authentic selves. To find out about upcoming webinars and about how Q can help you and your school, visit qlearning.com.au. And you can get even more amazing teaching resources right now at teachific.com.au. Stay tuned.